All right, open your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 1. I hope you have your Bibles with you because we are going to be looking at several scriptures today from the book of Mark. We begin Mark, chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we're going to begin reading in verse 16. Mark chapter 1 and verse 16. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James and James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were all who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. Notice he called them. And they forsook their nets. They forsook their job. They forsook their means of income. They forsook the family and the family business. They turned their back on everything they knew and everyone they loved and their means of livelihood and they followed Christ. In the second set of brothers, he called them, and they left their father, they left their family, they left their fishing business, they left their job, they left their home, and they followed Christ. They followed Christ. I want to talk to you about following Christ. I want to talk to you about what it is and what it isn't. We hear a lot of people talk about following the Lord today. I am of the opinion that the vast majority of them do not even have a clue as to what following Jesus really is. I will try to explain that in my remarks today. Notice that when Jesus called these men They left everything to follow him. They left everything. Their home, their loved ones, their family, their income, their jobs. If it's to get a little bit cool, you can turn the heat up a little bit. Are you cool? Are you you okay? Talk to me. Are you all right? Okay. They left everything to follow Christ. Everything. It is not possible that when the Lord calls you to follow him, that it will not cost you something. It's impossible. If it costs you nothing, God hasn't called you. It's going to cost you something. There are... Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pastors that get up in the pulpit every Sunday and it costs them absolutely nothing to preach what they're preaching. It costs them nothing. Nothing. They, lit, they, they minister through a, an entire career and it costs them nothing. Nothing. 
I know that what I'm about to say many of you can't understand. But it's absolutely 100% true whether you understand it or not. Every time I preach and every time I write a column, I risk everything I have with every message and with every column. I risk everything I have. I never know from week to week whether I will have lost everything I have. As far as I'm concerned, the preacher of the gospel is not willing to risk everything he has every time he stands behind the platform and the pulpit and preaches God's word. He's not a preacher worth two cents. Let me ask you, what does it cost you to, to follow the Lord? Did the Lord call you? What does it cost you? I, I am absolutely convinced that every one of you in this room have, that, have been, that have answered the call of the Lord, it has cost you something to be here. It has cost you something to be here, and it will cost you something to stay here. The devil hates Liberty Fellowship with a passion. We are lighting a fire of liberty and God's natural laws and the principles of God's word relating to these issues in a way that few people are across the country. And people are listening and people are being awakened. The letters that I read to you may just sound like another letter, but they come from the hearts of men and women whose lives have been changed dramatically through the preaching and the ministry of Liberty Fellowship. And they're telling others, and they're telling others, and they're telling others. And the devil hates this fellowship. He hates me, he hates you. And he will do everything in his power to destroy us individually and collectively in order to silence the voice coming from this platform. But we've answered a call or we wouldn't be here. And that call is going to cost you something. Peter and, and Andrew, James and John, from the very first moment that the Lord called them, from the first moment, it cost them everything up to that point. Their family, their friends, their job, their income, everything. To follow Christ. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 16, I'll just quote this one. I'll have you turn to it. We're going to turn to several scriptures here in a moment. And they, the children of Israel, answered Joshua saying, and of course Jesus is our Yeshua. He is our Joseph, our commander as Joseph was to the children of Israel after Moses, Jesus is to all of us who claim redemption and salvation by his blood. Our Yeshua, our Joshua, our Savior. This is what Joshua, Yeshua of Joseph's time, Joshua's time, excuse me, said, all that thou commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. All that thou commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. That should be our heart attitude to our commander in chief. Our Yeshua, our Joshua, our Jesus. Whatever you tell me to do and wherever you send me, I will do and I will go. Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, I want you to turn to this passage. Luke chapter 14 and verse 26. 
If any man come after me, if you are going to follow Jesus, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. If any man come after me and hate not his father and mother and wife or husband and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Let me read you what John Gill writes about this. This is the only reference to a commentary that I will make during this address. John Gill writes, These are not to be preferred to Christ, speaking of those family members. These are not to be preferred to Christ or loved more than he. Yea, these are to be neglected and forsaken and turned from with indignation and resentment when they stand in the way of the honor and the interest of Christ and dissuade from his service. You won't read that in any modern commentary, I promise you. But that's exactly what Jesus was telling to us. These are not to be preferred before, you don't put your family before Christ. Or loved more than he. Yea, these are to be neglected and forsaken and turned from with indignation and resentment when they stand in the way of the honor and interest of Christ and dissuade from his service. If they try to keep you from serving God, if they try to keep you from God's will, if they try to dissuade you from following Christ, such who would be accounted the disciples of Christ should be ready to part with their dearest relations and friends with the greatest enjoyment of life and with life itself when Christ calls for it or otherwise they are not worthy to be called his disciples. We're talking about following Jesus. When you follow Jesus, he is first. Not your wife, not your husband, not your children, not your friends, not your hobbies, not your work. He is first. And if it means you must forsake any of that in order to follow him, you will do it gladly Amen. and with enthusiasm because of your love for Jesus Christ. That's what it means to follow him. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto the Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. I'll follow you, Lord. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of, not, the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. You're not going to have a house to live in if you follow me. You're not going to have a pillow to lay your head on if you follow me. You still want to follow me? And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. He did not mean by this that his father had died and he was going to attend the funeral. That's not what he was saying. 
his father was very much alive and no knowledge of when he might die. He was saying, don't ask me to leave my family. Tell you what, Lord, when my family are, are gone, then I will follow you. Don't ask me to leave my family. And he said, Jesus, let the dead bury their dead. Go thou and preach the, God, the, gospel, the kingdom of God. Let the dead bury the dead. I've given you a job to do. I've called you to follow me. I've given you an assignment. Let, let the spiritual dead take care of the spiritual dead. A family member that would dissuade you from serving Christ is spiritually dead. They're spiritually dead. Let the dead bury the dead. Let the spiritual dead take care of the spiritual dead. You come and follow me. Another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid farewell, which are at home at my house. Same kind of a thing. I wasn't thinking about having a going away party and leaving. He's thinking about staying with these friends for extended fellowship. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back, looking back at friends, looking back at family, looking back at job, looking back at work, looking back at pleasure, no matter what it is you're looking back to, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We're talking about following Jesus. You do not follow Jesus on your terms, brothers and sisters. You follow Jesus on his terms, or you are not following Jesus, you're just pretending. You follow him on his terms. And he takes second place to nobody. If you put a husband or a wife or a mom or a dad or a brother or sister or a son or daughter above him, you have made an idol of that family member. And you have become an idolater. God has promised that he will not share his glory with anybody. And when you put someone other than the Lord on the pedestal of your heart and you make them the God of your life, you become an idolater. And you know what you're doing? You are bringing the judgment of God upon that family member that serves as your idol because God hates idols. And God will destroy all idols of this world. You want to you invoke God's judgment on your family member? Just make them an idol in your life. Revelation chapter 14 and 14, you, you don't have to turn. Revelation 14, 4, excuse me. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where he leads, we follow. These are the ones that God's promising the glory of, of heaven and the blessing of God at the end of the age. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Matthew 16, verse 24. I want you to turn to this verse. Matthew 16, and verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him, what are those next two words? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There it is. If you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself and take up your cross. What is a cross for? What is the only purpose of a cross? Say it. Death, to die on. That's the only purpose of a cross. If you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to take up your cross, your death to self. And follow me. You have, to, you have to die to your own will. 
You have to die to your own pleasures. You have to die to your own ambitions. You have to die to your own proclivities, propensities, and follow Christ. If you're not willing to die to self, you're not willing to follow Jesus. You're just a pretender. Look at John chapter 10, verse 27. Please turn there. John chapter 10 and verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and what? They follow me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The Lord knows if you are truly following him or not. We may not know. We may think, oh, you are a wonderful disciple of the Lord, and you're not. You're a pretender. The Lord knows if you are his and if you are following him. I know them, and they follow me. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Verse 18. After the resurrection, Jesus is talking with his disciples. This is the very end of John's gospel. And I want, I want you to read verses 18 and 19 with me. This to me is one of the most incredible, incredible things in the entire gospels. Jesus, verily, verily, I say unto thee, speaking to Simon Peter, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. You're not, wanna, you're not gonna wanna go there, but because you are following me, you will go there. It's not where you wanna go, but you're gonna go because that's where I want you to go as my follower. What was he talking about? This spake he signifying by what death he, Simon Peter, should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Simon Peter, follow me. What kind of death was Simon Peter going to die when he was old. Everybody knows now, church history has given us the record, several secular and biblical historians have confirmed the record that Simon Peter was crucified to death. When it came time for the executioners to crucify him, these same historians say that Simon Peter said, I will not die in the same fashion as did my Lord. And they turned him upside down and crucified him. From this moment on this is right after the resurrection and before the ascension Simon Peter knew he knew that to continue to follow Christ meant crucifixion he knew it 
Jesus told him, you're going to stretch forth your hands and you're going to be crucified. Follow me, Simon Peter. How many of you would have continued to follow Christ after hearing him say that to you? We do not know the death that God has prepared for us. We do not know the timing of it, and we do not know the cause of it, or the means of it, or the kind of death it will be. But Simon Peter was told by Christ that he was going to be crucified. And then Jesus said, follow me. And Simon Peter followed him. Every day, every moment of his life. For the rest of his life, he never wavered. Think about it. Every day he woke up, he knew he was going to be crucified. I'm sure as a human being there were never there was never a day that he did not think about that during the course of the day many times I'm going to be crucified I'm going to be crucified every morning I'm going to be crucified during the day I'm going to be crucified but it did not dissuade him from following Jesus Christ one bit. He became one of the Lord's mightiest disciples. Author of two of our New Testament books. The great apostle to the Jews. The accolades that we could heap upon the life of Simon Peter would fill volumes and have. But maybe the greatest accolade that we could say about Simon Peter is that he knew what his demise would entail and he chose to follow Christ regardless. That's following Jesus. Amen. That's following Jesus. Many, if not most, professing Christians today are not following Christ. They use his name. They will use, oh, the Lord led me to do this. Oh, I'm doing this for Jesus. But they're not. Let me tell you what they're following. They're following money. And don't tell me they're not. I've been around too many of them. They're following money. They're following family. They're following friends. They're following comfort. What makes them feel good? They're following security, and they're following pleasure. That's what they're following. They are brilliant geniuses at being able to spiritualize all of that away and make it sound to their friends like they're following Christ, but they're just pretenders. They're really following money. They're following family. They're following friends. They're following comfort. They're following security, and they're following pleasure. Isn't it amazing how the Lord has led them to be so comfortable? Isn't it amazing how the Lord has led them to be so pleasurable? Let me ask you folks that 
God led to Liberty Fellowship. When God led you here, who did you know here? Who did you know here? Let me ask you, when you, when God led you here, were you thinking about the weather? Were you thinking about the weather? Let me ask you, when God led you here, were you thinking about the cost of living? Were you? When God led you here, were you thinking about money? You may have left a comfortable position and a good paying job in order to come here. Were you thinking about that? Was that your motivation? Absolutely not. Let me ask you, when God led you here, did it matter to you who sat in the White House? Did it, did it matter to you who was in the White House when God led you here? Of course not. No, 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 no. You packed up and you left family, you left friends, you left work, you left a climate that you, that you were familiar with, you left a way of life that you were familiar with. Most of you came to a place that you'd never been before. You knew no one when you came here. All you knew was that you were following Jesus when he said, go to Liberty Fellowship. You followed him in the will of God. You heard a message of truth. And God called you to respond to that message. And God led you here. And God has blessed you since you've been here. In ways that you could have never imagined. And the reason that some people are not being blessed of God, I'm talking about Christian people, true Christian people, some of them are not being blessed of God, A, because they have a proud, stubborn, arrogant spirit. Number two, they are greedy and stingy and they refuse to give God the tithes and offerings that he demands of us as, as king and, and, and lord of our lives. Selfish, proud, arrogant people will not have the ultimate blessing of God. And so some people, they say, well, I don't know, you know, I'm just doing my best. I'm working hard. I'm trying. I'm doing all of this. And God isn't holding up his end of the bargain. Just because you're a thief. You're stealing from God every paycheck. Let me ask you something. If you know somebody is stealing from you, are you going to trust them with anything? You know they're stealing from you. God knows the ones that are stealing from him. He knows the ones that are stealing from him. Let me tell you something. If there is ever a glitch in the perceived promises of God. It is not God's fault, my friends. It is ours. God never fails us, and he never denies himself. He will always honor his word. He has given us 
certain duties and responsibilities, obligations, and yea, privileges as his children, as his servants, that we are accountable for. And when we do not do clearly and plainly what God has told us to do, don't blame it on God when he withholds his blessings from your life. God led you here. You weren't thinking about money. You weren't thinking about friends. You didn't know anybody. You didn't have any friends here. You heard a message. You heard a message. You heard a message. And God led you to this place. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Let's begin reading in verse 65. Jesus said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Our ability to trust Christ and to follow Christ is a gift that God gives to us. No man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Now notice, from that time, many, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Jesus had a church split. They didn't like the message. And they turned back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Oh, please don't go. Oh, please don't go. Is that what he said? He turns to twelve and said, Will you also go away? Look at them leave. Look at them leave. Andrew, Simon, James, John, Bartholomew. Look at them leave. You want to join them? There they go. Here's your opportunity. Are you going to leave too? And Simon Peter... who so often suffered from foot and mouth disease, sure nailed it on this one. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the, what? Words of eternal life. He didn't say, oh, you have the greatest music program in town. Oh, wow, your church has the best drama department in the whole city. And, oh, by the way, Lord, all my friends go to your church. Oh, I love that music director. Oh, I love the programs you have. Lord, you have so many programs in your church. I think I'll go here. What did Simon Peter say? Where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You have the message of eternal life, the message of truth. We are here for the truth. We are here for the message. I think I'll stay. All of the youth programs and children's programs and senior citizens programs and this program and that program and all these, all these so-called ministries that these 
churches spend billions of dollars for and spend exorbitant amount of time and effort in are not doing diddly squat to change our country. If you don't have a message of truth coming from the pulpit, all of those programs and things and tapestry is as sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. It is nothing. You have the words of truth, and we want. That's why God brought you to Liberty Fellowship. You wanted to hear the message of truth. You have a heart for the truth. You hunger for the truth. And you came here to hear the truth. Turn to Psalm, or the Old Testament, Psalm 1. We're talking about following Jesus. Psalm 1. The first three ver verses of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seateth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Notice the next phrase. And he shall be like a tree. What? planted by the rivers of water he shall be like a tree planted 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 among the many signs of a weak and decadent culture is the sign of restlessness. We are living in the most restless generation probably ever in our history. People cannot be still. They cannot stay put. They cannot, they're not planted in anything. They are moving to and fro, hither and yon, and they're never satisfied wherever they go. And they can't stay in one place very long before they have to up and move again. Restlessness is a sign of a wayfaring people who are not following God. They're following their own emotions, their own inclinations. The blessed man of Psalm 1 is a man who is planted like a tree. I'm not saying that God doesn't call one person uh, from one place to another. He can, and he sometimes does. But let me tell you something. You cannot accomplish much of anything without spending considerable amount of time doing it. I spent 35 years in the only other pastorate that I've had. 35 years. There were many times during that period when I was discouraged. I couldn't see any fruit I didn't think I was making a difference. There were many, many, many times in that three and a half decade period where I wanted to leave so badly. Felt I was wasting my time. Beyond that, there were several times that churches had called on me 
to come and be their pastor. And some of those churches, one in particular, two, I can think of, very, very large churches. And they had the big salary and the, and the, and the big benefits and they had unbelievable perks that went along with that position. Paid vacations internationally. I could have traveled the world on, on the, the dime of the offerings of that congregation that they willingly offered as a benefit of being their pastor. And time after time after time, whether it was discouragement, whether it was a feeling of failure, and I'm not getting through to anybody, and these people are completely oblivious to what I'm trying to teach them and couldn't care less whether I'm here or not, to the allurement and the temptation of something really wonderful and great over there the decision always came back to the same thing I knew that God had called me where I was and it wasn't my right to leave the call of God and I stayed Not because it was great and wonderful. Not because we were making a lot of money. Not because everything was going just one. Not because of anything except God said, go there. And I was a tree planted by the Gulf of Mexico. And some rivers too. When I left that place after 35 years when most men my age are retiring from their pastoral duties and are looking for a place of comfort and a place of perfect climate God led me to the mountains of northwest Montana. And I am telling you, I know in my heart, God led me here, and I am a tree planted by the Rocky Mountains. Do I ever get discouraged here? You bet I do. You'd get discouraged too if you had to look at you every Sunday. <laughs> and I asked, how many read my column this week? And half of you didn't even read. Oh, yeah, boy, that's a great incentive. Boy, that's a blessed my soul. Do I get discouraged? You bet I get discouraged. Do I have personal proclivities, inclinations, propensities about things that I would like, things that I would enjoy that may not be available to me where I live? Yep. It's not about what I want. It's not about what I like. Although I got to tell you, in all honesty, when I was in the Gulf Coast, in the will of God, I loved being there. I loved being there. As much as I hate heat and humidity, I loved being there. Thank God for air conditioning. 
And now that God has led me here and planted me here, I love being here. If it's 10 below zero, I love being here. I didn't move to the Gulf Coast for the weather. And I didn't move to Kalispell for the weather. I moved here for the will of God and to follow Jesus. And I had no idea what God was going to do with us here. We didn't know anybody here. We, we had never lived in this part of the world before. It was totally new to us different than anything that we'd ever experienced. We've had opposition since we've been here. But I stay here not because of any propensity, pro or con, not for any personal inclination, pro or con. I came here and I stay here because I'm following Jesus to be here. That's why I'm here. And that's why you're here. He shall be like a tree planted. You can't begin to get anything done in, a few, in just a few years. You, you, you're never going to be able to really invest yourself in the lives of people and really make a difference in the lives of people if you don't stay by the stuff for a, an extended period of time. I want you to notice the book of Amos, since we're in the Old Testament. Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. Two verses. Behold, the days come, saith the 11 and 12. Behold, the, late, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread and a thirst for water. Not that kind of a famine. But a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. I say we're in that famine today in America. People really don't want to hear the words of the Lord. They want to be entertained. They want to be stroked. They, they, they want to have a pleasant message making them feel good. The famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Now notice the rest of the verse. And they shall wander, they shall wander, they shall wander. They shall wander, they shall wander, they shall wander. From sea to sea, from the north to to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and they shall not find it. If that doesn't describe the modern church in America, I don't know what does. People are, are wandering everywhere. They're running to and fro. Oh, oh, I'm going to get the word of God over here. I'm going to get the word of God over here. Oh, the Lord's led me over here. Oh, the Lord's led me over here. And they wander and wander and wander to and fro, to and fro, to and fro. And they're going to get the word of the Lord and they shall not find it. And so many of them, when they do find it, it doesn't mean anything to them. That's where we are as a church in, a, in this country. That's a big difference between he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, isn't it? A couple more verses and I'm done. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 14. Take your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 14. That we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Children have no stability of mind. 
children will go from toy to toy. They'll go from thing to thing. Their attention span is very short. And all the young parents said, yeah. You give a child, those of you that celebrate Christmas in this way, many do not, but if you do, and you have a Christmas present for your child, and you went to the store, and you spent hours trying to pick out the perfect toy that my child will enjoy, and you finally figure out what it is. And of course, all the advertisers helped you make up your mind, as to which toy that was, and so you picked it out, and you put it in a, in a box, and you wrapped the box, and you gave it to your boy or girl on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, and the little boy or little girl opened the present, and they played with the toy for two minutes. And then they spent two hours playing with the box the toy came in. Hello, yes? You could have got an empty box, put a wrapper on it, and the kid would have been just as happy. And then they want to play with sister's toy or brother's toy. And then they don't want to play at all. And then they want to go over here. And then they want to go over there. They're children. They have no stability of thought whatsoever. They go from thing to thing. If it's shiny and sparkly, they want it. And as soon as they get it, they don't want it anymore. And then when the other kid comes along and picks it up, then they want it again. <laughs> They're kids. We expect that kind of behavior with children. They haven't grown up. They're not mature. Their mind isn't fully developed. Their heart's convictions are not developed. Principles, priorities are not developed. They're children. But in America today, we have adults in the church acting like children. They're going from one shiny thing to another shiny thing. From one attraction to another attraction. Over here, over yon, to and fro. That's not following Jesus. When you follow Jesus, he puts you someplace and he, he uses you and blesses you and puts you through trials and hardships. He chisel, chisels away at the character of your soul, chisels away at, at your thinking, and he, he chisels away your personal ideas and opinions and propensities, what I want to do and where I want to go, what I want to be, and he, he chisels all of that away. And he makes you a mature man and woman of God, standing firm in the face of whatever opposition Satan may send your way. And he uses you to show others how to live a Christian life and how to follow Jesus through thick and thin, high and low, hell or high water as they say. That's following Jesus. Yeah. I leave you with one last verse, and that's in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Verses 32 and 33. Luke chapter 17, verses 32 and 33. Jesus said, Remember Lot's wife. Very short and to the point. 
Remember Lot's wife. What are we supposed to remember about Lot's wife? God sent his angels to take Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, when an angel knocks on your door and tells you to leave, it, yeah, it's time to leave. As they were leaving, God began raining his judgment upon those two wicked cities and cities round about, the Bible says. Lot's wife, on her way out of town, looked back at Sodom and Gomorrah. She looked back with a heart of yearning. She looked back wondering in her own mind, I have family back there. I have kin folk back there. The, f the city is burning up. They lost relatives. They lost family. They lost friends. They lost everything in the fire of God's judgment. But God spared them. God took them where he needed them to be so they could be spared his judgment. There is, I don't care who's in the White House, there is a judgment of heaven falling on this country. It has already begun. It's not a matter of if, it's already begun. It will only become more and more severe as time goes by. And depending on where people live and the circumstances and the conditions of the very, this is a huge country. This is not, this is not like a small European nation. This is a huge country. And the nuances of God's judgment on this nation is going to be varied from place to place, city to city. We always think of America as just one big nation and everything is, it's all one. It, we have never been one nation. Do you hear me? Constitutionally, we have never been one nation. And when that 14th Amendment was unconstitutionally added to our uh, amendments in the Constitution, it changed the definition of what our citizenship was. Un until that 14th Amendment, we were citizens of the individual sovereign states in which we lived. And now then we talk about American citizens, U.S. citizenship. It changed it from citizenship of a state to citizenship of a nation. And we talk about one nation. No, we're not one nation. We are 50 sovereign states forming a coalition. But that's not the way... It's treated anymore. 
people don't talk about a federal government. They talk about a national government. We don't have a national government. At least we're not supposed to have a national government. It's a federal government. A federal system means a division of power. It means that we don't have one authority, the central government of Washington, D.C. We have 50 sovereign authorities, each state separate and distinct and sovereign among itself. And every state has the ability to say no to the federal government if it chooses to do so. That's how this country was formed, but that's not, the way it's, that's not the way it's called anymore. We've lost that distinction as, as a people, and as a result, we've lost the liberties that were protected thereby. I talked to a sheriff yesterday for probably two hours, and he was rehearsing with me many of the times that federal agents have been in his office trying to coerce him into doing what the federal police agencies wanted him to do at the expense of the freedoms of the people in his county. And they demanded, and he told me the stories, of how they tried to circumvent the authority of the sheriff who is the highest law enforcement officer in any county And that sheriff, thank God, over and over again as the occasion arise, told those federal police agents in no uncertain terms, I am the sheriff of this county and you will not bully the citizens of this county and I refuse to roll over and accept your authority above the authority of the people of this county. And he threw them out of his office. Thank God we still have sheriffs like that. Right now in the state of Washington, they have passed some of the most egregiously tyrannical gun control bills in the entire country. Maybe California, New York, a couple states might be worse, but extremely draconian gun laws in the state of Washington. There are, if, if my memory is correct, and I'm close if it's not, 39 counties in the state of Washington. As of now, 21 of those sheriffs, 21 of the 39 sheriffs in Washington state have said publicly they refuse to enforce those draconian gun control laws in their county. So they are still there. It's not all over. If you don't think there's going to be a difference when these things begin to truly unravel between the Flathead Valley of Montana and New York City, you're out of your mind. There are states and the people within those states, Denver, Colorado, Seattle, Washington, Newark, New Jersey, New York City, Chicago, Illinois, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, all across this country, where the governing authorities of those communities and states have already accepted the chains of tyranny around their hearts. And they will have no problem whatsoever in implementing 
tyranny against the citizens of their people when the time calls for it. There are other places around this country in all honesty, most of them are rural in nature who are far more reluctant to surrender their liberties and who are far more determined to preserve their liberties no matter what governing authority says, give up your guns. If you don't think there's not going to be a difference, from community to community, from state to state, from region to region, you're not, you're not thinking straight. Before God destroyed the city of Jerusalem, he took his faithful Christian born-again believers out of the city to places that he had reserved for them in the mountains just throwing that out it was it was in the mountains God led them and when the Roman armies came through the city of Jerusalem sparing almost no one our Christian forebears were not there. God had taken them to a place of protection. I believe God is still taking his children to places of protection. The ones that are following him. So it won't be universally equal when all this happens. And you and I at Liberty Fellowship, we need to understand something. We are living in a somewhat normal society. I, I hear you. I got it. I said somewhat normal. We're able to have a job. We're able to go to work. We're able to go to a restaurant and eat if we want to do that. We are able to go to a store and shop. We're able to get in a vehicle and we're able to travel. It's somewhat normal society. So we live our lives as it is meant to be, for the most part, individual. We're all individuals. Our families are different. Our family needs differ depending on the age of our children, depending on a lot of things, how old we are, etc. A lot of individuality in this room, different needs. And so we live our lives individually in this valley. We go to our individual places of work, we go to our individual stores and shop and all these things it's like it's like a normal society would when the day comes and it will that the somewhat normal way of life is expunged we will not be individuals any longer we will be a fellowship of people working shoulder to shoulder, toe to toe, brother to brother, sister to sister, helping each other, supporting each other, not only just praying for each other, but assisting each other. The young will need help. The older will need help. They'll need, they'll, the needs will be will be great and varied. And we will be forced by circumstantial will of God. I say circumstantial to us. It's providential to God. And this fellowship that meets together on Sunday and 
an occasional Wednesday for spiritual instruction and fellowship will be forced to be one in fellowship, not just on Sunday to hear the words of truth from the pulpit, but Monday through Saturday to help each other and to assist and to know that each person in this fellowship is someone we can trust. At that moment, this fellowship will be worth its weight in plutonium. Let, let me be honest with you, and I know gold is worth more than plutonium. I just said that because you weren't expecting it. When we, this is just a personal acknowledgement, I guess. When, when we first started praying about God's will and this life-changing decision of ours to leave that place of 35 years of sunshine and warm weather. We began, and you can talk to Alan, and he'll, he'll repeat everything I'm saying. We talked about the pros and cons of everything, everything. Just everything was open. Our minds, our hearts were open to God. We just put it all on the table, everything. And when God began to lead us here, I thought, you know, And it didn't, the decision was already made, so it, did, it wasn't affecting me whatsoever or the others. But I got to thinking about what, what, what is God doing? And to try to figure God out, which we never can. But the fact that this is a cold weather climate, I determined was a benefit not a liability. I thought it was a plus and not a minus. And one of the reasons I thought that, and I still believe that today, one thing about when God leads people here, if they are sunshine soldiers, they will not stay here. We have had scores of people who have come. God led us. And then two months later, they're back in Florida or Texas or wherever it was they came from. And all of a sudden, God changed his mind and didn't want them here anymore. No, they weren't really following God to begin with. And they were doing it on their own thinking and ideology and philosophy and so forth. The one thing about where we live that I think is so advantageous, it keeps people away who aren't serious about the message. Are you follow me? If if your if your life is all about the weather, 
then go where the weather is balmy, but don't talk about you're following Jesus. You're not following Jesus, you're following the sunshine. Isn't it amazing how Jesus has led 27 million people to Florida and a million people to Montana? Isn't that amazing? It's a plus. Because when things do get tough, and they're already tough, but I mean when they get tougher, I want, I want people around me that I know are here for the right reason. And that's what the Montana climate gives us. So I say to those of you that are watching online, if you have that, that notion that God is calling you to the Flathead Valley because of the message you hear, well, if it's because of the message and the fellowship and you want to be around like-minded believers who know what's going on and who believe the truth and who care about truth, then it's not going to matter to you what the weather is. And if you are thinking about coming, but you're wondering, well, I just don't know. I don't know if I can take the cold climate. Let me just save you a lot of time and money and effort and tell you to stay where you are because it does get cold in Montana. In this winter, for example, every winter is different. This winter, December and January are usually cold winter months. I mean, it's winter time. So they're usually cold winter months. This year, December and January, it was like, where's winter? You know, it's like, you know, we got to the end of January and I was saying, wow. Winter bypassed us. You know, it was just like, there wasn't a winter. And then February came. And we have had a full winter in one month. It's been cold. It's been snowy in the month of February. I'm not going to kid you. It's been a tough February. Sometimes it's harder than other times. Sometimes it's not that bad. I grew up near Chicago. Chicago winters can be awfully bad. The, some of the Midwest this year got winters that were on record. They had colder temperatures. Flagstaff, Arizona had 10 feet of snow this month. Can you believe that? Arizona. That's not normal, but it did happen. The point is, if you're following Jesus, what the temperature is, where the Lord leads you, doesn't matter. Hey, if God leads you someplace, does he know what the weather is there before you get there? Huh? Come on. If God leads you someplace, does he know who the people are before you get there? Huh? If God, if God leads you someplace, does he know what the cost of living is? Does he know what the monetary situation is before you get there? Does God know all those things before he leads you someplace? Yes or no? Yes. We only have one job. That's to follow him. Remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. Don't look back. You want God's judgment, just look back. Remember her, his wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Oh, you got it all figured out, what you got to do. 
you want to go here because it's this and you want to go here because it's that and the money situation, the economy here and the cost of living and the cost of real estate is here and this and that. And oh, you know, this is great for retirees and this is not so good for retirees. And oh, you know, I like the sunshine over here. I like the weather. He that seeks to save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. And that's our job, is to put ourselves on that cross that we carry every day and die to ourself and live to the will of God and follow him. Let's stand for a word of prayer.